Thank you, Troy. Appreciate that. And uh, I trust you will all say, whether you were in the military or not, it's an honor to serve Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. And uh, that's a theme we'll be carrying through in difficult times um, this morning. If you open your Bibles, please, to 1 Peter chapter 3. We'll be reading from verse 8. Verse 8 on to 13 at first. But uh, 1 Peter was written to groups, uh, Christians that were scattered in areas that is now uh, present-day Turkey and maybe some other areas as well in Asia Minor, but, uh, or in Asia. But uh, it was difficult. As you read through, you realize they're, they're going through trials, severe trials that are trying their uh, hearts and trying their faith. And there's persecution going on. There's other kind of trials. And, and so it's very applicable for us, certainly today. And uh, let's just take a moment to pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you, dear God, for this opportunity to open your word together this morning. And ask God that you would uh, bless and guide as we look as to what you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let me read verses 8 through 13. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who is he who will harm you if you will become followers of what is good? Now, Peter, think about it. Peter is addressing these individuals are going through difficult times, and yet he exhorts them to righteous living, exhorts them to make sure that you are working together as a church body, that you have a good testimony outside the church. And we think of the strains that um, COVID has put on the church, and we think especially in the context of, of our church in, in Germany that we just left about six months ago. And take a look at verse 8 to see how applicable that is when you're going through thoughts and processes. It says, be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers and be tenderhearted. And we know that uh, um, by these exhortations, we can come through and have a good testimony for those that are on the outside. Um, we noticed in the building of the church in Eichstätt five years ago that there were some people from the church in Ingolstadt, but then there were a couple other families that moved in recently. They were Christian families, moved in from other types of churches into the area, wanted to be part of the new work, but um, was thank we we're so thankful that they were willing to talk over their differences, their ideas, so that they could, we could meet this and that we could all as a church become one of one mind. That was the exciting thing about it. Not everybody thinks the same. We shouldn't, but we should all have the same goal. And we could see that happening. Um, that was a real blessing. In fact, there was one guy, one young family. Uh, um, his dad had been a, a church planter, and really kind of wondered, well, how is he, gonna, is he always going to compare what I'm doing to what his dad did, you know, how it could be? And yet... Uh, what this young man says, you know, boy, if my dad only had started this way, it would have been so much easier. It's the interesting thing it is, 25 years ago, we had met his parents. Um, we knew them when uh, this guy was like, you know, seven years old. So that was kind of kind of a fun reunion. And then his parents moved into the area, and we still had, had some good fellowship with them. But in any case, God brought these people together, and we could say we were, we were of one mind and could have compassion on one another. You know, people have different needs, and especially when there's trials and, 
and persecution happening, maybe somebody will be more affected than somebody else. And uh, instead of looking at, oh, why are you being, having such a hard time? I'm doing great. The Lord must be blessing me. And what are you doing wrong? Well, that would be a bad attitude, wouldn't it? That, but God says, be of one mind. When some suffer, then the whole body suffers. And, uh, and so that's how it, it ought to be, that especially to uphold that one who's going through a hard time and not look down and say, well, why are you, what's happening with you? You must not be right with the Lord. Well, if that's the case, then come with compassion and, and uh, confront the brother in love. But then love his brothers. Um, look over at chapter 1 and verse 22, and you see what uh, Peter already wrote about loving he says, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love or uh, unhypocritical love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. In other words, put their needs above your own. And that's so important uh, when we have different ways of looking at things and, and that we respect and appreciate one another having true love. And also when when there can be such a, a great love and care, like in our, our core group of 14 adults, so we had about, all together, maybe about 22 people with the kids, and uh, you can come, kind of become um, just your little group and not accept new people. Well, that would be kind of bad if you're wanting to see a church grow, wouldn't it? And so there has to be an effort to bring those new folks in to that circle of love. And that's what we could see happening in Germany. Tender-hearted. Um, that word has the idea from the bowels, strong feelings for one another, kind of like compassion. But uh, we were excited to hear. Uh, it's one thing about with the COVID thing, they live stream even their Wednesday night meetings. And uh, that's in our private group, though. But it's kind of fun for us to be able to listen in and we could hear a testimony time at the end of the year. And one young lady who isn't, wasn't able to be baptized and join the church because of uh, her work and, and things, she would lose her job, and she was still really wondering what to do. But she comes regularly, and she needed to have uh, some operations and, and uh, some medical work done. And the ladies of the church really reached out to her, and, and she, her testimony was she never felt so much love and care. And so that was a great testimony to hear uh, how the church is carrying on and following through, being tender-hearted, being um, compassionate. And then also courteous. So we respect one another in the church. We're kind. Be kind one to another, right? Tender-hearted. And uh, so it's great to see uh, when a church body is able to fill that, even when under stress, under pressure, and even as in uh, this original receivers of the letter under persecution. But then it goes to the testimony to the world, verse 9, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Now that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Um, of course, we know we shouldn't return evil for evil, uh, and that's not easy to return good for evil when somebody puts us down or something like this or, or we get... Um, criticized or whatever the case may be, maybe even losing a job because of what somebody said, but, um, but return good for evil and to, as it says, um, but blessing. And I had to think, what in the world does that mean? How can we be, how can we, who are we to bless? You know, I mean, we get blessed of God, but who are we? But the idea here is just to say something good. And that's the idea. So instead of, Returning the bad words, we say something good. And uh, the church had a, a challenge uh, there in Eichstätt. There was uh, one man in the building where, we, where the church is housed. There's not, uh, six apartments. Um, two of them are occupied by people from the church, but there's other, the other four, we get along with the other three neighbors pretty well. There's one neighbor who is critical and... Uh, you know, even during the COVID times, he, we was, he accused the church. He went to our landlord, went to the city, and accused the church of not following the COVID regulations. Well, Lily has been very, very up on the regulations. He's talking with the government every week 
to make sure that we are following because we want to be a testimony in the city. And uh, he called right away to the city and, and he described what we were doing. They asked everything and, he's, and they were just fine with what we were doing. And that was great to hear. But uh, it's important for the church then to, you know, not to be critical of this man and return evil for evil, but rather um, be positive and be able to uh, say good things about him. He is a nice guy. But we're uh, praying for his salvation. So we can be a blessing. And uh, that's very important um, to be able to say those things that are good that we can say about others that they may realize their need of Jesus Christ. And he goes on in verses 10 through 12, and here Peter quotes Psalm 34, basically saying, you know, what can go wrong if you are doing the right thing, right? If you're kind to your neighbor, if you're helpful, um, all these things. Verse 13, he summarizes, who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? Well, Lots of people, <laughs> as you find out. If you're doing speaking truth, if you're doing even out of love, you're speaking the truth in love, people, not everybody will want to hear it. Not everybody will respond positively, and Peter understands that. In verse 14, he says, But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Set him apart. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, if it be the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And so, um, so we see here that there's going to be times when we will be confronted. We will suffer for doing what is right. And uh, it's very, very, he gives us four steps here to take that are uh, very, very timely for us today as we see pressures from the world coming upon the church, that more and more uh, pressures to conform to the worldly mindset in many, many areas. Um, I won't go into detail on those. I think you can think of situations right now. But, um, but we need to understand that this is our opportunity to shine as a light in this world. And uh, perhaps people who weren't willing to listen before, when we are under pressure, whether it's individually or as a church, that uh, God is opening up using this as a way to... Be a testimony that people may yet come to Christ. I mean, that's our longing, that's our heart's desire, right? That, that those around us, our relatives, friends, co-workers, people that have refused the gospel to this point, that they may come to Jesus Christ. And so there, here's these four steps that are so important for each of us, and we can easily remember them. First of all, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid because we shouldn't panic in the face of opposition. Uh, Peter speaks from the heart on this one, doesn't he? On the night Jesus was betrayed, what happened to Peter? He stood up there and he says, hey, if, uh, if I have to die, you know, I'm not going to deny you, Lord. But what happened? Shortly after, he denied Christ three times. So he knows what he's talking about. He panicked, and that wasn't good. So we need to not be afraid, don't panic, but remember the words of Jesus, do not let your hearts be troubled. He, Trust in him to let you, let God use you even in difficult situations. Uh, one um, book I was reading about persecution in the church in different par parts of the world, they said there are churches that totally shut down out of fear of per perceived persecution. And yet when some a group of pastors says, hey, wait a minute, we're... We are operating out of fear. This is wrong. Let's just stand up and let's just say we need to fulfill what God says for us to do. We need to go out and preach the gospel. And they started doing it. And there was no persecution. And they realized, hey, we were, we were just uh, stunting our church because we were just refusing to obey God. 
And um, so we need to really evaluate that. And the, the conclusion of this writer says we, never, we should never let the persecutor or the perceived persecutor be the one to determine if we're going to speak up or not. That should be, we are always free to speak up. There may be consequences, and there may be no consequences, but we should make that decision to obey God and let him, let God decide what's going to happen to us. So secondly, so do not be afraid. Secondly, sanctify or set apart the Lord God in your hearts. Make sure Jesus Christ has first place in your hearts. Make sure that he is Number one, that we want to glorify him. He is the Holy One. He is the God of the universe. Make sure that he has first place in our hearts so that we can obey him, so that we will be strong in our, in our proclamation of the gospel. And then be ready to give a defense. And as it says here, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you or the reason for the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. And now we think of apologetics. That's where that word comes from, the defense or an answer. And uh, so we think of, well, I have to know all the reasons why we know that the Bible is true. We have to know 10 reasons why Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God and, and why creation is true versus evolution. All those things are important, and we have lots of good resources, and praise the Lord for that. But really the context here is talking about when you are under pressure and you are faced with this cho choice to obey God or to deny him, what are you going to do? And you are going to be ready. You need to be ready to give a defense why you are not going to deny the Lord. And, uh, you know, why, why is it so important for you to stand up for Jesus Christ even though it might mean prison or even though it might mean you're losing your job or even though it might mean loss of contact with family members you know those are real things that happen but are we willing to um, take the uh, accept those kind of consequences and so they what they're expecting here you know when we are under these pressures and we ask God for help and we are going to say you know I don't care if I lose your friendship but Jesus Christ died in my place and he forgave me of my sin. He gave me new life. Um, you know, I was thinking about, and when we were singing the song, Just As I Am, I was thinking about uh, what God, how God worked in my life over 40 years ago to bring me to Christ. And I thought, you know, that is so important to me, what he did in forgiving my sin and giving me new life. I'm not going to deny the Lord. And by God's grace, you know, with his strength. That's what we need to say. And uh, I think of uh, a testimony a lady gave in one, in the, in one church in Germany. Um, she had taken the risk to be caring for her father who it had, been, had, found, had been found after some medical condition. He had been found a couple days, passed out, and yet he was still alive, but it was going to take a long time for him to recover. And she, she and her family showed care and concern, and, uh, and that would be absolutely normal you know, when I'm telling you this, so, so of course she is going to be caring and concerning until you find out that this father was very abusive and uh, really was very, um, yeah, there would be no reason for her to want to react in love like that. And it was really a risk from her other family members for her to do this uh, for misunderstanding and all that kind of thing. But, there, but she gave testimony. It says one of, I don't know if it was a relative or a neighbor that says, when, when they notice how she and her family were so caring and loving, he says, there must be a God. There must be a God if you are acting like this. And see, that's the thing. When we are under this kind of pressures and we react in a way that pleases God, people will take notice. And maybe they never cared about our words before, but they see these genuine actions. There was another lady in our church that, in fact, the one who was baptized saw the picture of her, um, she took the step of quitting her job. She had thought about it for a long time, and, and uh, she was a healthcare worker. She was a, a nurse's aide type of situation in a, in a nursing home. And three days after she took this step to quit her job, um, her mother-in-law had a, had a medical condition where she would need daily care. And uh, 
Now she was available to do that. She could care for her mother-in-law. And her husband, not a believer, said, your God did that. You know, and that's, that's the thing that when we take steps of faith and do things and, and, uh, that we know are, are right, others will take notice where they perhaps may have ignored what we have been saying. And so she, this lady had the privilege then of being with her mother-in-law every day for the next couple of months before her mother-in-law did pass away. And uh, we know that uh, she had opportunity to share Christ with her. We don't, I don't know the, if there was any result, any, any uh, acknowledgement on the part of her mother-in-law or not. But uh, what a great thing to be in that position to give the reason for the hope that's within you. And that's what we're talking about. And do it with meekness and fear, with, with uh, gentleness, um, not uh, harshly, with meekness and fear. And then finally, maintain a good conscience. Verse 16, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. We can just summarize it. Don't do anything that you would be, for which you would be ashamed. You know, that we maintain that good conscience before the Lord in what we do and what we say so that uh, God may be glorified. Um, very important. You know, Jesus is our example here. When he was on trial or when during his life, people tried to implicate him, get him to trip up in his words, and, and Jesus never uh, fell to that. And everything he said, he maintained a good conscience, and we need his grace to be able to do that as well. Once again, the principle of verse 17, it's better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Take a moment and think about that. Why would it ever be the will of God for us to suffer for doing good? And yet we have example after example in Scripture. Uh, Joseph suffered for doing good. For running away from sin, he got a chance to sit in the prison cell. Um, Jeremiah, for proclaiming God's um, truth, he got the opportunity also to sit in, a, in the bottom of a well. Many other examples, of course, ultimately Jesus Christ. He never did anything wrong, and yet he suffered and paid the penalty for our sin. As it says here in verse 18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. You see, there was a purpose in the suffering of Jesus Christ, wasn't there? Praise God for that, because now we can be redeemed. We can never pay for our sins. We'd be doing that for all eternity. That's why hell is eternal, because we can never pay. For those that have not received Christ, that is the, that is the ultimate destination. But for us that are saved... He took our sin upon himself. And, and, and that's true. He took the sin of the world upon himself. So if you're here today or listening, you can also receive forgiveness. You, because the just one, Jesus Christ, suffered for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. And that was his purpose in suffering. Now, the purpose of our suffering is different, isn't it? Um, as a Christian, we don't, we don't pay for someone's sin. That's already been done. But it can point others to the reality of the forgiveness of sin in Jesus Christ, that we are willing to put our lives on the line um, because we care about others that they might hear the gospel and be saved. So as we uh, conclude today, just have a couple of questions for you. Have you received the forgiveness which, is, which only Jesus Christ can give? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? He offers, for, he offers this salvation. The just suffered for the unjust. He wants to bring you to himself. And maybe if he is speaking to your heart to say, you can um, turn to him. You can simply acknowledge your sin, repent, and say, yes, I am that sinner that Jesus died for, and I want the eternal life even today. But if you are, as a believer and you want your life to count for the Lord for as many days as we have left. We don't know how many years, days, months that we have on this earth. You want your life to count. Remember these, these four steps. To not be afraid. Do not let fear 
drive you. But uh, set the Lord apart. Make sure that he has first place in your life. Um, be ready to give an answer. Speak up why you are willing to stand up for Jesus Christ and then maintain a good conscience and be willing to suffer uh, if it be the will of God.